Hello and welcome to Jason Live. My name is Patrick Shea and we're back once again with our STEM career series where we learn about careers in science, technology, engineering, and math from role models currently working in those fields. Joining us today is Roderick McLeod. He joins us from London, England. Uh, he is currently the chief navigator of the exploration vessel Nautilus. Roderick's a great example of a STEM career path that's made a few interesting twists and turns along the way, including jobs in high tech and financial industries and a stint as an officer in the British Royal Navy. We'll learn all about how he got where he is today in just a few moments. But first, I want to remind all of you out there that this event is both live and interactive. You can use the box just below this video window to answer, uh, I'm sorry, send us questions and participate in our polls. We'll try to get as many of you involved today as possible. But right now, I'd like to get Roderick involved. Welcome, Roderick. Thanks for joining us today. Good afternoon. Awesome. So we're going to start off um, with your current career. Uh, Chief Navigator of the Nautilus, and I actually have a video question that's going to get us rolling today. Let's take a look. Very good. Hi, I'm Rocky, and I'm Brittany. We want to know what a navigator does. And do you see a lot of sharks? What does a navigator do, and do you see lots of sharks as a navigator? Okay, so I'll answer the second question first. We see sharks fairly regularly. Sharks uh, live uh, deep in the sea and they come to the surface sometimes as well. Uh, we've seen sharks as deep as 600 meters, certainly the ones I've seen. Six gill sharks, I've seen a bull shark. This is uh, a six gill shark you're seeing right now. It's just uh, very large. I think it would have been, I'm going to say it's about eight feet long. Good, good size for a shark, eight to ten feet. Then the, the first question, which is what does a navigator do? I'll uh, try and keep it concise. A navigator during a dive works with the two pilots, that's the Hercules pilot and the Argus pilot, to make sure that the dive progresses the way it's meant to progress in terms of where we are on the seafloor. Also ensuring that the ship is in a good position for the ROVs down below it, and, uh, and then making sure that what we're doing as a team, as an ROV team, uh, fulfills the, uh, the criteria set by the science team. The science team is always there driving the mission they want to learn stuff about the, what's going on uh, along the seafloor, and we're there to facilitate that. So we have to work very closely with the scientists to make sure it all happens. Outside of a dive, I work with the um, with the expedition leader to make sure that the ship is in the right position for the next dive. So, going a slightly more big picture, why don't you tell us a little bit about the Nautilus and and what an RV is and our what a pilot is? You know, put put all of this into context for us so we can really understand what what your role is in in that navigator position. Very good. So the the Nautilus is an the exploration vessel. Nautilus is a deep sea exploration vessel. That means that we have uh, some very sophisticated ROVs. ROV stands for Remote Operated Vehicle. Uh, this is the ROV Hercules. Um, you can see it's about the size of a, a very small car, and it's connected to the ship via the tether. You can see the yellow tether that comes out of the back. Um, and it can go down to about 4,000 meters. Um, and alongside Hercules, we've got a second ROV called Argus. And right now, we're in the deep there, and the video that you're seeing is being filmed from Argus. So they work as a tandem, as a, as a pair when they're down in the, in the deep sea, and they're connected uh, via a, a very thick um, steel cable to the ship. And, uh, and when they're not down in the deep, they're on the surface on the ship, and uh, the ship moves around in various areas that we're aiming to explore on the sea. That's sort of the big, the big picture of how we operate. And, and so this is a little bit different than when you would think of a navigator on a ship that doesn't have our ROVs or isn't exploring, you know, that, that kind of a navigator really is just getting you from place to place. But your role in this is, is quite a bit different. Yes, I would say my role is, is more closely related to being an F, F sorry, a flight controller. So every time the, the, uh, we go on a dive with the ROV Hercules and Argus, it's a, it's a three-dimensional problem. We're sending a vehicle down below the ship, we're flying above the, uh, the, the sea floor. Um, so it's very, very similar in terms of the discipline, very similar to flying. So as a navigator, I 
operate as a, more like an aircraft navigator or a, um, or a flight controller to make sure that the vehicles are in a safe position, that the dive is, is um, moving forward in, in a way that allows us to A, remain safe and B, fulfill uh, the, the mission objectives that have been set by science. Well, I'm glad you brought up the uh, notion of air traffic controller, which we all know is a, a very stressful job. I have a text question that came in from Sean, and he's wondering, is it nerve-wracking being a navigator on the EV Nautilus? It's a very good question. Um, it depends, I think, is the answer. Uh, I think when you start off, it's extremely, it's extremely tense. There's a huge amount of data that you have to pull into your brain and, and uh, process in order to, to function as a navigator. And in the first, I'd say the first month is probably pretty hard work. And so we get people on board who haven't done it before, and I train them up. And, uh, and I must admit, it's kind of, I've done it for a while now, but I, I do enjoy training people and seeing how they react. And, and also what's very interesting is to see how different people find different aspects of the job more or less challenging. Some people find some aspects very easy and others more difficult and different people it's the complete reverse we've got another question coming in this one from Vedhas he wants to know during normal days on the Nautilus what's the most important part of your job hmm, well I guess uh, risk risk management in a sense uh, as a navigator you, you're taking a lot of decisions uh, that regard the safety of the vehicles and the safety of the ship, and that I would I would kind of categorize those decisions as risk management decisions. And as a navigator, that's probably the most important part because you know we're out there operating. When we're operating, we're doing 24-hour a day missions. If something goes wrong with the vehicles, if a bad decision is taken and one of the vehicles gets broken, or there's we put the ship in a, in an awkward position and something happens with the ship because. Uh, we, we've put it in, in a wrong, in a, in a bad place. Um, that's a very, it's very costly in terms of time. Uh, so we want to make sure that everything's operating smoothly all the time. That's the risk element. Great. We've got a couple more questions. These are uh, two related questions. Lucy wants to know how you would describe your workspace, and Victoria wants to know what daily life is like on the Nautilus, and, and what do you usually do? Very good. So, uh, for Lucy's question, the, the workspace, uh, the main workspace is the control van aboard the Nautilus. And uh, I would say that's a bit like a, um, almost like a space mission control center. In fact, it, when you're in there, it feels like you're inside the ROV itself. It's a bit like being inside a submarine. So, it's uh, a bit like a, a combat control room inside a U.S. Navy ship, or like being inside a submarine, or being you know, controlling a mission on Mars. It's this very, uh, very real, um, intense environment where you're just immersed in what you're doing uh, for, for as long as your, your shift lasts, and the shifts tend to last four hours. So that leads on to the second question, which is, how, what's a day, a day like? Um, each person on board the ship that's part of the science team does two shifts of four hours um, that are separated. Sorry, is, is that correct? That's right. Yes, we have eight hours, eight hours. So there's uh, two shifts of four hours separated by eight hours. So you do four hours on, eight hours off. Uh, so you wake up, go on your, go on your watch for four hours, then you'll have eight hours off during which you've got to do um, you know, all your, your daily stuff. There might be various types of work. For a navigator, there's a lot of mapping uh, work to be done between shifts. Here are some other navigators on the screen right now, Carter and Suleiman. And then, and then you'd go back on your second watch uh, for four hours, and then you have eight hours to sleep. So it's a, f it's a very regular pattern. But having said that, each day is different. Every mission is different. And so although you have this regular sort of work sh shift, then a daily work, and then shift, and then sleep pattern, the, uh, the, the content of what you're doing changes every single day. And obviously you have meals, and the meals tend to be pretty good on board. We've got a video question coming in next. This one is from Ebenezer. Hi, I'm Ebenezer. When you explore the ocean, does weather ever affect your mission? And do you have to know a lot about meteorology to be a navigator? Yes. Yes to both questions. Um, 
weather does affect us very significantly. Um, if the weather's just sort of uh, general daily weather affects us on both the launch and recovery phase uh, of a mission, and then when we're, when we're diving, as long as the wind or the, the current isn't too strong, the weather isn't too, too important. If we get a lot of waves, that can be damaging to the uh, aid of the ship in terms of just uh, uh, discomfort. But uh, especially if there's lots of waves, that can be damaging to the equipment underwater because you've got the ship bobbing on the surface, pulling on this uh, thick steel cable and, and the pulling and letting go as the waves rise and fall on the, um, on the ROVs is not good for the ROVs. So weather is extremely important and meteorology too. So we, we study the, the meteorology every single day. We've got another video question coming in. This one's from Noah. This, this could be somewhat related to that last answer. In your occupation, what is the most difficult task you complete on a daily basis? Most difficult task? Um, well, living on board is, is, is a challenge in its own right. Um, so that's, but I wouldn't say that's difficult. You get used to that. Uh, the, the weather you have to check every single day. Um, certainly, maybe some of the decisions, taking some, some of the decisions that you have to take are probably, probably very difficult to take in the sense that you have to weigh a lot of different elements of what's going on, the, uh, the amount of time uh, that you have allocated to a mission, uh, the weather, um, uh, you know, there's, it, can get, it can get very subtle. Uh, the risk to the vehicles, risk to the ship, and so on and so forth. So um, I would say the most difficult part is probably taking decisions when some of the variables are far from the order, such as the weather, or you've got a mechanical problem and you're having to decide whether to dive with or without, you know, with a mechanical problem or stop and repair the mechanical problem, those sorts of things. But those decisions I don't take uh, alone. That's, there's a lot of uh, input, obviously, from, uh, from the expedition leaders and the operations management on that side. So, Roderick, I, I think it's safe to say that this is a pretty unique career path to be a navigator, There's especially of an exploration vessel. Not too many of those out there and, and not too many navigators. I'd like to shift gears a little bit and talk about career path. I had alluded before to the fact that uh, you've had kind of a diverse and interesting career to get you to this point. Um, why don't we go way back to when you were in, in school, say high school, um, and talk me through how you got to where you are today. Okay, so I'll try and keep it short. <laughs> it's a long time ago. But um, uh, so started off in high school. I need, I, in the UK, you have to decide whether you, what subjects you're going to do. And, uh, and I felt it was important to be able to, uh, to stick to, uh, to mathematics and science. So I did a lot of mathematics and I did a lot of physics, but I wanted to balance that out, so I also did English literature and French literature uh, as I graduated from high school. Um, and then I continued into engineering when I was at university. Uh, and the idea was, you know, that life has a lot of opportunities. There's so much that you can do. Um, but if you, if you move out of the sciences, it's very hard to go back in. So I thought, well, I'll just carry on doing the sciences and see where that takes me. And if I want to do something completely different later on, I can always do something completely different. But the sciences got me through uh, to, to MIT. I graduated from MIT and, uh, and went to work for uh, Cisco Systems doing communications work on, uh, on cable networks. Um, and then following that, I was there for a year. We got to the, the big boom and bust of the, of the internet in 2000, and I left Cisco and went and joined the Royal Navy. And that was something I'd always wanted to do. It was different from, from working in science. But where I joined was in the, uh, in the aviation side, doing navigation, which uses a lot of engineering skill. So it was, it was appropriate, and, and I, was, I was well suited to that work. Um, I stayed with the Navy for two years and then decided that the... Uh, the element of, uh, of, of aggression that's involved in the, in the services was not necessarily something that I wanted to pursue. So I changed careers and moved into finance um, as a way of uh, earning a living and uh, did a master's in financial engineering. That led me to New York. I worked in New York for three years until the, uh, the big bust in 2008. And at that point, uh, I, I thought, well, this is really not what I was expecting in terms of uh, in terms of what's going on, some of the decisions that were being taken, um, I, I didn't agree with. And so I thought, well, I'm just going to try and do something that I really believe in. 
and uh, and I had the opportunity of uh, joining the Nautilus in, uh, in for the summer of 2009, and I haven't looked back. It's been the most incredible experience I could have ever dreamed of. It's a really interesting career path. I have a few questions coming in uh, that I want to share with you that kind of follow up on some of those ideas. Um, here's the first one. This is from Noah. Um, I think we've talked a little bit already about what it's like being the chief navigator on the Nautilus, so we can move past that point. But he wants to know what skills are required and, and you know, how are these skills that you learned along the way uh, applicable to what you're doing on board the Nautilus? Yeah, so that's, that's a really important question. Um, and it comes back to the idea of, you know, you're at high school, what, you know, how, what kind of, um, what kind of uh, arrows are you going to put into your quill? You know, how are you going to decide what skills to gain? And I think it's very important uh, to, to stick. If, if, you, if you're slightly, you know, if you're scientifically inclined or mathematically inclined, it's important to stick with those early on because it's very difficult to gain those skills later um, just because of the kind of discipline and rigor that's required to gain them. So that's been incredibly important and useful for me uh, throughout what I've done. I, I stuck with the maths and physics. Um, I did engineering at university and having got a good university degree, that degree from MIT, it's really allowed me to, to go and do things uh, which which are really rather different from each other. Uh, but if I hadn't had that university degree, people wouldn't have taken me seriously uh, when I knocked on their door and said, hey, I'm, I'd be really interested in, uh, in you know, doing a, a master's in finance at UC Berkeley, or I'd be really interested in joining the Royal Navy, or I'd be really interested in joining the, um, the Nautilus. That, that element of credibility you get from a solid, solid um, university degree is very important. Um, now, in terms of the Nautilus itself, I'll just, I'll just quickly finish this. The, um, the training I got in the Royal Navy was extremely important for becoming a navigator uh, on board the Nautilus. The, uh, the, two, uh, the two skill sets are really very, very similar between uh, navigating an aircraft over water and navigating an ROV underwater. Uh, you just reverse the picture, but the picture is essentially the same. Um. We've got another question coming in here. This one is from Edmund. He wants to know, did your parents encourage you in your work and in, in your studies growing up? That's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really important one. My parents were extremely supportive throughout my studies. And, uh, and that does, that, that, that did make it easy, easier for me. That's, that's definitely clear. Um, and then later on, in terms of my career decisions, I think my, my, uh, my parents would have liked me to stick to something that was very safe and secure. And so when I, when I joined the Navy, they asked me, why, why are you doing that? Because they, they thought of me being off doing dangerous things. And then when I joined the, uh, the Nautilus, they, they, they didn't really understand why I wanted to do that either. So uh, for the education part, they were supportive. For the, some of the decisions I've taken since, they've, <laughs> they've had their own questions. So, you know, to a certain extent, is an education like the one that you described, um, you know, is it just proof to everybody down the line that you're capable of doing a really hard thing? Because, you know, it's a very valuable thing, but it is a, a, a challenge, certainly, to get an engineering degree from MIT. There's, I would say it's twofold. And, and it's, uh, there's the proof that you've done something where you've had to really apply yourself and uh, and and uh, you know put yourself up against the wall and and um, and achieve uh, what you set out to achieve. But the actual um, the, the how to how to describe it the the discipline of maths and science and the the, the scientific process. And if you are able to harness the scientific process um, into your own self, it allows you to deal with reality in a way which you aren't able to do before you gain those skills. And it's the dealing with reality and the processing of information uh, that allows you to be successful. And I think um, there's obviously the, 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 the brand name or the, the branding that's important in terms of I have done this, I've succeeded, and people know that you've done it. But it actually gives you a huge amount. It teaches you how to think. And that's, 
that's of fundamental importance. We're going to change it up a bit. You've been answering a lot of our audience's questions. Now, we have a, an opportunity for you to ask them a few questions in our poll. So we're going to push our first one right now. And uh, Roderick came up with this. He wants to know when, when he was in school, he did not think he wanted to be A, a circus performer, B, an astronaut, or C, an engineer. Which one of these do you think... Roderick had no interest in being when he was back in school. Uh, let's see. We've got the question posted. Go ahead and vote right now. We're going to start to take a look at the responses coming in live. They're pretty evenly divided, Roderick. Oh, circus performers taking the lead at 67%. No, that's dropped back down to 50 but is still in the lead. Roderick, what is... What's the incorrect answer? What did you not want to be? I didn't want to be a circus performer. I, I can't I imagine why. <laughs> well, maybe that one was a little bit easy, but we've got another one coming up right now. Let's jump to poll number two. Which subject did Roderick not think he would need in his future career when he studied it in high school? Was it math uh, or is it physics or was it biology? A, B, or C, math, physics, or biology? We're going to give uh, just a second here because we just got that posted. And we're going to ask everybody to go ahead and vote now. Biology, 75% is taking an early lead. We've talked a lot about math today, so that's pretty low. It looks like biology is going to be our winner. Roderick, why don't you let us know, what, what, what did you not think you would need in the future back I, then? I didn't think I'd need biology, but I worked with biologists on a daily basis on the Nautilus, so I had to revise a lot of it. So was it that you, you just didn't study a lot of biology, or you just didn't take it quite as seriously? I, I don't think I took it so seriously. Got it. All right, let's move on. Uh, we're going to talk now about some of the things that uh, are not necessarily related. Maybe they are, maybe they're not. But let's talk a little bit about kind of the personal side of things, get to know you better uh, outside of your STEM career. Um, right. We have a question, a video question right now from Sean that's going to get us into this segment. I was just wondering, what was one of your favorite things to do as a child? Was it reading? Was it writing? Did you play with toys? Or was it sports? Well, I did. I enjoyed uh, building things in Lego a lot. I did a lot of Lego building cars and planes, and I don't know what I did. I mean, I just built a lot of stuff. Um, that was as a child, and then later I got. Uh, I guess in high school I was more interested in sports. I also liked music a lot. Um, I played the guitar, and I, I play a lot of uh, play a lot of music. And what sports were you involved in in high school? Uh, soccer and rugby. Makes sense. We've got another video question coming in. This is uh, from Haley. Let's hear what she has to say. I've read you're getting your master's degree in art and science, and I was wondering how the two interconnect. Uh, well, that's a, that's a very topical question because um, the, it's a two-year course. I'm finishing my first year. The second years have just graduated, and they had a symposium yesterday where the whole we had a, a group of people who came in precisely to discuss uh, discuss that issue. And uh, really, art and science are two sides of the same coin. You can't have art without science. You can't have science without art. It's um, it's almost down to how the, the human brain works. And uh, so, what what the course aims to do. Is to is to bring them back together in a in a, in its in their own as a discipline, where you've got art informing science and you've got science informing art. It's a very big discussion. We could go on for hours about how how specifically they're related. I'd have to think of examples and so. We'll have to have you back and and do a program specifically focused just on that question, so we have enough time. Um, we've got a question coming in now. This is from Emily from Oregon. She wants to know, what is your favorite thing to do in your free time, and what was your childhood like? Okay. Um, I guess if, if you're talking about free time on the Nautilus, uh, I, I 
write emails and uh, and I sort of just take time out to to, to relax. Uh, exercise is really important on the, on the ship, so I'd say it's a mix between emails, exercise, and just enjoying the fact you're on the sea. Uh, when I'm on shore, uh, I enjoy, uh, yeah, music. I'm, I, I love music. I uh, kind of live a lot through that. And then I can't remember the second part of the question. What was oh, my childhood like? What, what was your yeah, childhood I grew up like? in Switzerland. It was uh, very mountainous. So I was a lot in the mountains when I was a child. Okay, we've got another question here. It's from Kai. If you had to pick something that was not STEM, what would you pick? Now, what, how would you interpret that question? Because I'm not sure exactly what he means. Like a subject or? I, I would say a, a career path. A career path? Oh. Um, oh, well, being an artist. Okay, potentially related question coming up here from Ashley. How long do you think you will have a career as a navigator, and are there other careers that you would pursue in the future? Well, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about that. <laughs> but um, <laughs> no, uh, as navigator, I'm gonna. I'm, I want to continue for the, the foreseeable future. I mean, good. Uh, I, c I could continue. I mean, it's a lot of time at sea, so there's a certain sacrifice that's involved with 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 being at sea for long months um, uh, every year. Um, but I could see myself doing it for at least the next five, 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 seven, perhaps even ten years. We're certainly not trying to put you out of that job uh, any quicker than that happens. Um, another question uh, from Sean, who has clearly read your STEM role model profile, uh, in which you describe yourself as adventurous, and he's wondering, what do you do that's so adventurous? Take unusual decisions. Um, no, I, li I like to travel. I like uh, exploring on land as much as I do on sea. Um, I mean, I think, you know, every day is an adventure. I think it's a state of mind being adventurous more than related to anything specifically you do. Do you, do you enjoy, you know, getting up in the morning and, and see the day as a, as, a, as a challenge and something to be, you know, conquered in an adventurous sort of manner? Or do you just get up and uh, see things as humdrum. It's a lot to do with the way you see things, I think. Makes sense. We're going to keep on going with the questions here. Uh, this next one is from Charlie. He wants to know, to somebody who might want to do this when they grow up, uh, what kind of tips or advice would you give? So if we're talking about people who are in high school, I'd say, uh, you know, stay out of trouble. Uh, get, get good, uh, enjoy your work. Enjoy what you're doing. Enjoy the studies that you're doing, um, because uh, if you're if you're able to, to, to study and you have the the privilege of being able to study, you should uh, you should use it to, to the maximum uh, advantage that you can. It's it's a great thing to be able to uh, to improve yourself, to learn, to grow, um, and 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 view it as a, as as something that's really great. I mean. There's more out there. There's more knowledge out there today than there ever has been in the history of mankind. There's so much to learn. There's so much to explore on just uh, learning. Uh, you know, in the dimension of learning, there's so much to explore, and uh, and just enjoy it and make it your own adventure. We're going to continue exploring questions here. This one's from Lauren. She wants to study marine science in the future. She's a volunteer at Mystic Aquarium, where Dr. Ballard's ocean exploration is located. And uh, Dr. Ballard said he was inspired by the movie 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Uh, do you have a similar tale of inspiration? I guess I was probably inspired by Dr. Ballard. I remember looking at the uh, sort of falling through the National Geographic in 19... I think it was 1985 when, when they published the, the finding of the Titanic. And uh, I remember seeing pictures of the ROVs on deck. I remember seeing pictures of the, of the Titanic itself. And it, was, it affected me very deeply. I never even remotely thought that I would ever be involved with that kind of world. And I just feel extremely lucky to, to, to be part of it today. We've got another related question coming in here. This one is from Colin. Excuse me. He wants to know how has life on the Nautilus changed your life? In in many ways. I mean, being on the sea is uh, is a very different environment to being on land, and you don't really understand that until you've spent quite a lot of time at sea. Um, and it does it does 
it does change, alter your perspective of things. It alters um, how you understand nature, and it also changes how you understand yourself. You're, you're spending a lot of time at sea with not that many people on a, on a small ship, and, uh, and it, it does... Uh, does affect you. It affects you in a very positive way. Uh, funny you should bring that up. We have a question, video question from Alex. He's wondering about life on the ship. Let's hear what he has to say. Do you and the rest of your crew ever have any troubles getting along? Do you ever have any troubles getting along on board? Well, there's, it's, a, it's, a re, it's a question of primary importance. Um, ship is a very small environment. It's an environment where everything gets amplified very, very fast. So if there's, if there's any bad feeling, that gets amplified very fast. But equally, if things are going well, it feels really, really good, and it's a really good, strong feeling. So I think what happens on board is that most, most people who are there um, uh, have quite a lot of experience of being on board, and they know how to, how to behave. And and generally, people get along very well. Sometimes, but it's rare, do we get somebody on board who's maybe a bit cantankerous or not really meant to be there. Um, but all the rest of us, we navigate around that. I think it's safe to say that that kind of attitude applies to pretty much any career. You need to be able to get along with people to get things Absolutely. done. Okay, we've got another question coming in here. This one's from Elizabeth. Um, we're going to just answer the first part of this question. How does deep sea exploration contribute to society? Why is it important that we spend all that time on the ship to find out what's down there? Well, I, I have to admit that I, I take it, look at it from a perspective of, of uh, the interpretation of, of what's going on. And so I think there's a huge amount that we've gained as a society on a, on a cultural level or just thinking of the, the cultural aspects of it, in understanding how our globe functions. And that a lot of that has come from oceanography over the past 30, 40 years. Um, the te plate tectonics, uh, the, the various elements of how the, the, the system, the ecosystem of the globe functions. Um, if it weren't for oceanography, we wouldn't understand any of that. And so it allows us to then take decisions, um, both individually and also on a policy level, that make more sense uh, in terms of protecting what we have, which is which is a, a beautiful planet. We've just got a few more minutes left, so we're going to go rapid fire with the questions that have come in here live. Uh, this one is from Garrett. He wants to know: Do you prefer living on the Nautilus or on land? Mm. When I get back to the Nautilus, it feels like home. So I don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> I think I like both. Renette wants to know what kind of music do you like to play? Um, I like to play the guitar and I play all styles. Um, I'm more of an improviser. I like to express myself. I like just to have a conversation with the music. It sounds a bit... People get annoyed because I don't know songs. I say, do you know this song or that song? I say, no, but I can, I can accompany the conversation and I can talk to you through the guitar. <laughs> think that's a bit odd at first, but then they tend to enjoy it the nerve of those people. Uh, Sandra's up next. She wants to know, what surprised you the most about anything you've seen or witnessed in the deep ocean? There's lots of surprising things that happen on a very regular basis. But I think the most surprising were some fish. There were some fish we saw that I thought were impossible. I couldn't believe that such fish existed. One of them looked like a, like a bus, literally. And then the, the other fish had legs. I didn't. I, how is it possible to have a fish that has legs and fins? Turns out there's a fish that has legs and fins. Well, we'll, we'll see if this next question uh, relates to that fish. This one's from Ben. He wants to know, did you ever get attacked by something in the sea, whether it had legs or fins? I, uh, I haven't been, well, I've been stung by jellyfish. I guess that's a form of attack. Um, I got a, but that was that was unrelated to, to ROV work. Um, sometimes the ROVs do get attacked by sharks. Um, some sharks sort of re react to the electrostatic properties of the ROV and, uh, and and go bouncing into them. We haven't had it, but there have been occasions 
where ROVs have come up out of the water and they've got a shark stuck in them because the shark just swam straight into it and attacked it. Okay, we've got one last question. This one's a video question from Maya. Um, this probably has some uh, navigation aspect to it. Let's hear what he has to say. Hi, Mr. McLeod. You talked to our school last fall, and you told us that you found a lot of shipwrecks. Why are there so many shipwrecks in the Mediterranean? Why so many shipwrecks in the Mediterranean? Well, uh, the first reason is that people have been sailing ships around the Mediterranean for a very long time. So they've been doing it for probably 5,000 years. Um, if, if, we'll, if, if we think about the various phases of history, certainly the Bronze Age, we saw a lot of shipping. That was three, 4,000 years ago. And then the Iron Age uh, right through to today. So a lot of shipping. Therefore, over time, you're going to have maybe 2% of ships sinking every year. And if you add that up over thousands and thousands of years, that's a lot of shipwrecks. That's probably the statistics, essentially, is the reason why there are so many. Makes sense. Well, Roderick, I want to thank you for joining us today. It's been great talking with you. And, uh, you know, I think you've inspired many students out there to uh, potentially follow in your footsteps uh, wherever that career path might take so thank you for joining us i know we'll all be watching you on nautilus live this summer and uh following your adventures thanks for joining thank you patrick i think we'll be live somewhere around the 10th of june i'm not sure exactly and we will be letting everybody know through the jason channels when that happens so stay tuned um we're out of time uh but our STEM role model series continues in two weeks. We'll be back with Atsuhiro Muto on June 13th, same time. He is a glaciologist. And uh, that actually will do it uh, for this spring season. We'll be back in the fall. Uh, keep an eye on jason.org slash live. We'll be posting our fall schedule very soon. Um, and as always, follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Get all of the latest Jason news through social media. Uh, once again, my name is Patrick Shea. Thank you for joining us on Jason Live. We'll see you next time. Take care.